Sheriff's Office. Hi, ma'am. Um, this is Scott Sunford. I was robbed last weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I live at 3 St. Hilaire. Anyways, uh, after the robbery, I had an ADP alarm system installed, and they put it on a one-week trial period where if anything went off, nobody would respond. And, okay. And uh, today at 324, 327, and 328, I had three census trips, and I've been out of town with family for a funeral. My wife was home. And I have okay, did somebody break into the residence? I don't know. I've been out of town. I'm just on my way back. And I haven't been able to get a hold of the wife, so I was just hoping somebody can come meet me out there. It's probably nothing, but I would feel better. In the quiet town of Yakima, Washington, a peaceful community was shaken to its core by a heinous murder. On a cool spring night in 2013, a young woman named Desiree Sunford was brutally killed in her own home. The police interviewed Scott Sunford, Desiree's husband, but we're left with more questions than answers. Code 3 presents the first installment of this three-part series, The Interview with Scott. Join us on this journey to uncover the truth about a deadly love triangle. Security stuff I got on here. Okay. Like I told you, my name's Sam Pearl. I'm a detective here at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, I need to let you know that we're being recorded here, audio and video in this room. There's a camera right. up in the corner there. Um, I want to just read a little introduction here so that the people watching the tape later know what we're talking about. Following statement concerns a shooting that happened on or about April 7th, 2013 at Yakima County Sheriff's Department case number is 13C04701. Today's date is, I think it's still the 7th? Nope, it's uh, April 8, 2013 now. The time is 002 hours. Location is Yakima County Sheriff's Office in Yakima. Present during the statement are myself, Detective Sam Peralt, and Scott Sunford. What's your full name? Scott Ingvall Johan Sunford. Okay. It's and, Norwegian. Okay. What's your address? Okay, and what's your age and date of birth? 31, July 19th of 81. Okay, do you understand that we're being recorded right now? Yes. Do I have your permission to keep recording? Absolutely. Okay. What's your cell phone number? 509. Okay. And who's your carrier? AT&T. AT&T. Uh, you said you had an iPhone. So. Yeah. And since we're here at the sheriff's office, I'm going to read this to you. I don't expect you've probably ever been in trouble, but I'm sure you've seen this on TV. What's uh, that? You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right, the right at this time to talk to our lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. If you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before question if you wish. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Okay? Do you understand each of these rights if I, as I explain them to you? Yes. Okay. There's one thing that does confuse me, though. What's that? Generally, if you read somebody their Miranda rights, that implies that they're under arrest. Uh, no, not always. It just means that we're conducting our investigation. I can tell you, you're you're not under arrest right now, okay? okay. Um, but we are here at the sheriff's office, and so and we're being recorded. So, as a matter of protocol, 
when we're conducting our, our investigations, we do read people that are Miranda warnings, okay? Oh, okay, that makes sense, because at least this way you have it on record that I'm receiving my Miranda rights. In case there is an arrest later on, you can't say I wasn't read my rights and get released. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so you understand what's yeah. going on, and having those rights in mind, are you willing to keep talking to me now about what happened out at your house? <laughs> of course. Okay. As much as I can. I mean, I can't help you too much. I wasn't there, but... Okay. Um, well, I wasn't either, and I just got here literally fact, a few minutes ago. So can you just kind of start from the beginning and tell me tell me what happened? Well, quite honestly, what, you just your understanding of something else. There was a shooting. Right. Okay. What can you tell me? All I know is that we were called out to your house and that... Uh, there was a body found um, and uh, it looks like the person had been shot so that's where I'm asking you to jump in and help me fill in the blanks as far as what led us out there um, okay um, <clears throat> sorry All right, um, let's see. You said today is now the, what, 8th? It's the 8th now, yes, okay. just after midnight. On the 6th at uh, 10 in the morning was my Aunt Joy's funeral service in Pasco, or kind of like at the city church. So uh, that morning, I guess it'd be Saturday, I uh, I left the house at probably 8, 830. Okay. And that was the last time I was there before your, well, the last time I was in my house. Um, after I, I left there, I went down to the Tri-Cities. I uh, went to the service and uh, from that point on, I was with my dad and grandpa and uh, Oh, I don't know, the service probably ran on until about two or so, maybe less. I uh, I called Des after the graveside portion and the luncheon portion. I was just kind of trying to get away from the old guys for a minute and mm -hmm. get up and walk around. So I went outside and I gave her a call and sat there talking on the phone for a while. And uh, I told her that the my Aunt Mary and Frank were having a dinner out at their place at 6.30, so I was going to go out there, and uh, I was going to be a little later than expected, because the idea was I run up, go to the funeral, hugs, handshakes, turn around, go home. And, uh, you know, I had got some family from the coast and from all around that I hadn't seen in quite some time, and mm -hmm. a lot of that side of the family's kind of yuppies that I don't get along too well with. You know, I'm blue collar, military mechanic. Don't really hang out with the sharp dress crowd too much. Yeah. So, uh, luckily, the the ones that I like made it up there, and uh, we got together for dinner. And it ran a bit late. It was probably 11 or so. And uh, I told her, you know, I it's, it's kind of rainy, it's windy, I'm tired as hell, long day and they want to do a breakfast get together in the morning I'm gonna stay here for the night so I did and uh, went out there for breakfast and we were around for a while and I don't know probably probably around noonish or so we left that and uh, went back to my dad's house with him and my grandpa and uh, got together some old m guitars that were still at his house and some sanders and stuff because I got a kitchen table and some chairs for her not too long ago but the chairs needed to get refinished and of course you know new homeowners we don't have too much stuff around there for stuff like that yet mm -hmm. so I hit up my dad and he gave me a few old sanders that he had and he's a woodworker so uh, got those loaded up in the car got the guitars in there and everything and uh, let's see Oh, I guess it was probably about 5.30 by the time we finally got out of my dad's house. 5.30 this evening? Yeah. Okay. 
It was a, a quick trip. <laughs> he lives down he's on the Tri Cities. Right? Yeah, he's in Kennewick on three twelve East okay. First Place. Okay. And uh we all left there and went down to Carl's Junior in Kennewick and did dinner there. And I don't know, I would have to say probably about seven thirty ish. I'd have to I'd have to verify it was seven seven thirty in there is when I finally left and uh I went south on three ninety five and hopped on eighty two to Yakima came up that way and um I came in on the uh what's the name of that Conowack pass okay. yeah I took the old Yakima highway up to Conowack pass mm -hmm. and uh during that drive on eighty two i Tried repeatedly, in fact, I'll see if I can give you some times. Uh, my dad and my grandpa and I had been joking around about how, ah, it's strange, Des hasn't called yet, you know, she hasn't, uh, hasn't been bugging me yet today, because she's a real stickler on the times. She schedules tight. Yeah. I adapt and overcome and kind of go spontaneous. So we'd been uh, joking about that. And uh, let's see. Uh, all it's showing is the last phone call to her at 9:11 p.m. But uh, that's the last time you t tried to call her. Yeah. Um, anyways, I'm sure the phone records could give you more specifics if you need them. But uh, all along the drive, I just kept calling her randomly, trying to get a hold of her. And I sent her a text even at one point, you know, why aren't you answering? And uh, just wasn't getting anything from her. And it was kind of freaking me out because, well, after the robbery last weekend, Deputy Wuchek had said that it looked like they had been interrupted or spooked or something and they may be back. So the next day we had a ADT system installed. And... Uh, it was all kind of starting to build up and driving me a little nuts. Mm -hmm. And before I even made that turn off to the Yakima Highway, you know, maybe 45 minutes, half hour outside of the Tri-Cities, it was kicking in. And I kept thinking, you know, maybe I should just call somebody and have them go check on her. Maybe I should call the police. Oh, no, that's silly. She's probably in the shower. She's probably going to the bathroom doing something. Or she's outside because she'd said something about wanting to do some yard work. So I had to fix the tire on the wheelbarrow for her. So, eh, probably left the phone inside her. She's taking a nap, it's on silent. You know, I just kept telling myself everything's fine. And uh, I couldn't take it anymore. If I call and she doesn't get it, usually within 10, 15 minutes, she's picked up the phone and called me back. You know, what's going on? So, uh, by this time, it had already been like an hour of me trying to get a hold of her with nothing. And I took her car to the Tri-Cities and left mine because, well, the last weekend when we were out of town was when it became illegal to be running studs, and I still got my studs on the charger. Mm -hmm. So it was like, ah, don't need a ticket. And Crown Vic's full of gas, charger's on E and has studs. Come on. And so she convinced me to take the cop car. <laughs> so I, I took hers. And she said she didn't want to drive my car. She's like, I'm not even going to drive it. Don't even bother leaving me keys, whatever. Like, well, it's keys anyways. If you need it, take it. And uh, so I wasn't expecting her to be gone. really didn't think she'd go anywhere. And with the way the wind was, I knew she wasn't going to take the bike anywhere. She's kind of a picky rider. And uh, so it was driving me nuts. And about the time I got on the Conowack Road-ish area, it, it was too much. I called. And the first gal I talked to, I told her, you know, I'm, I'm probably just crazy, but I checked my phone a little while ago, and I got uh, the, the alarm system was set to arm stay, meaning that she's at home. So that kind of implies that she was there mm -hmm. and the motion detectors turned off for the stay home and the motion detector comes on for stay gone well when it's home the door switches still work 
And when I checked the phone and I saw that both doors had tripped within close time frame of each other, um, when I looked at it, it said front door open closed like 324. And then back door open closed 327, open closed 328. So in my head, I put that together as she goes in the front door, out the back door, and then, you know, obviously shuts the doors behind her and then comes back in the back door and shuts it. So she should be home. So why isn't she answering me? Mm. She should be in the house. Because that, that's in, out, in, you know? So it was really driving me nuts, and I had to call him. And I, I called in, and I talked to the dispatcher, and she said that uh, there were no units available. When one became available, they'd have him run by, and she asked, you know, about where he at. And it's like, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes from the house, maybe, if that. And uh, so I started heading up the road a little bit further, and I checked the alarm system again. And then it came back as, like, offline, cannot connect something. You know, it was being really weird on me. So I stopped over there uh, just on the other side of the highway on the Foucher Road and, was it 24? Mm -hmm. Just on the, the south side of 24 on Foucher Road, there's a um, large gravel lot. I don't know if it's, like... Uh, a semi feeding station where they you know dump the grain into the trucks or something but uh, I pulled in there real quick and I went through and closed out all my apps and rebooted the phone and then when I came back online it was fine and I went ahead and armed the alarm system and set it as armed away so the motion sensor was active thinking the alarm system is going to start chirping in the house Des is going to go over there and disarm it, so next time I look at my phone, it's going to be disarmed. Or she's going to hear it going off, she's going to walk through the house and trigger the motion sensor, and it's going to piss her off, and she's going to disarm it, and she's going to call me and be like, what the hell are you doing? Don't do that crap, that's annoying. You know, I was just absolutely certain that was going to happen. And uh, it didn't, and that scared me. So... Uh, I kind of stalled a little bit. I drove around waiting, just giving her that chance to call me and uh, giving the deputy a chance to get free and get over there. And uh, I headed to the house and I pulled down the driveway and I went down the driveway to the left and I fired up my spotlight and I pointed it at the back door. Uh, I noticed my charger's there so she must be home. And I put the light up on the back door, and I noticed that the board that I had screwed up there from the previous break-in, the bottom quarter of the board had been broke off. And you could see the window was all messed up again. So immediately I got back on the phone with dispatch, and I told them, my house has been broken into again. My wife is not responding. She should be home, and she's not talking to me. I need some money here now. And uh, I stayed there. I kept waiting. I kept waiting. I couldn't go in. I didn't know what the hell to do. So I backed the car up a ways and uh, got on the phone. And I, I called my friend Brian that lives out in Gleed. He and I worked together. We deployed together. He's uh, in a little motorcycle organization, man. Combat Veterans United. Mm -hmm. Do the fundraisers for all the veterans' families. And uh, I called him up and asked him, you know, hey, you awake? You dressed? Will you come over? I think I need you. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm in my sweats. Give me about 45 minutes. I'll be there. So I can't, couldn't go in there. So uh, I just waited. And after a little while longer, it was driving me nuts again. So I got on the phone and I called up my dad. I told him, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what the hell to do. Somebody's broke in. Dad should be in there. And she's not answering me. And uh, if she's... Uh, 
I can't walk in and see anything. If something's wrong in there, I can't see it. But at the same time, if somebody broke in when she was there and uh, she got hurt or restrained and I was sitting out in the car, sitting outside while she's scared and uh, I can't go in there to help her, that was going to drive me nuts. So uh, I asked him, you know, hey, what the heck can I do? And uh, it's like, well, you got my 45 on you, right? Yeah. Go in there. So just as I was regaining myself, getting it back together, getting ready to do it, uh, the deputy from Moxie pulled up alongside me. And... <sighs> God, it could not have been better timing. Because right then I was able to just say, hey, my alarm system's on. It's, it's off. <laughs> Here's my keys. Please. I can't do this. And, uh, yeah, I just waited there. And he walked around. And I, uh, I stayed at my car. Had the spotlight on the back door still. Had the door open. Standing in the door, you know, using it for cover. Casey spooks him out the rear and uh, had my weapon ready but not drawn and uh, just stayed there waiting and he he circled the residence and he, he went up from around the back side and all along the picture windows and across the back by the master bedroom and bath mm -hmm. around the fr uh, fence onto the patio and in the front door and uh, he came I it had been a little while. It seems like I should have seen lights coming on. I should have seen flashlights in the windows, something. And I got nothing. And uh, I didn't hear anything either. So I walked around, and I, I wanted to see if the bikes were there too. Because, you know, maybe, maybe she was bound and determined. She had to run down to the store for something. She has her own bike that she rides? Yeah, I got her one of the uh, newer bike than mine. <laughs> I got her a 2010 uh, Sportster 883 iron and uh, welded up a little cargo rack for the back of it and everything so she could use it for school and uh, so I went into the garage real quick and I checked to make sure the bikes were there yeah both bikes are there my car's there her car's here I look over and there's the deputy standing out on the front patio looking like he's on the phone or on the radio or something he had device up to his head and uh, he saw me and immediately started walking over and I didn't make it any more than about halfway to the gravel to him when he said you know go wait over by the car uh, I'm coming with you let's go over there uh, I opened it uh, he said I opened the door and I, I called for Des and I got no response. I, I hollered police department, nothing. I didn't see a dog. Nothing's going on in there. It just doesn't seem right. I got backup coming. So we stood over by the car for a minute, just kind of talking, you know, shooting the breeze. And uh, all of a sudden out on the gravel road there on Rosa, I see uh, three cars coming, running, code three. <laughs> so uh, he's like, wow, they sent three of them. I was expecting one. Heck yeah, send 10. It's kind of important to me, man. Yeah. Bring them all. <laughs> well, the three cars get there, and they uh, they line up, and they tell me to go, go wait in my car. And uh, they went back in the, the front door there. And uh, then another car shows up, and I, I think it was the sergeant. It appeared to be shorter than the rest of the guys, graying hair. And uh, he kind of pulled in to the back and right and not really falling in the line with the rest of the guys and started heading for my back door. And I told him, you know, hey, the other four went in the front door on the other side. Go to your right. And he kept going for the back door. And once he saw it was still closed, he looped around and went where I told him to. And uh, then another car shows up out there. I assume that would have been you because they said that a detective was on the way or... Oh, it must have been a different detective. Oh, okay. So, yeah, then that car shows up, and 
next thing I know they come outside and one guy's patting me down they're asking if I'm armed I'm like yeah I just told the other deputy you got a 45 right side inside the waistband hip holster you know and uh, I had it in the car because well that's my dad's old gun you know I was bringing it up from the Tri-Cities and, and when I was pulling into the house I stopped up at the end of the driveway right up there by the dumpster about halfway to the house and uh, went around, popped the trunk, and quickly slapped it on before I came down. So I was ready to go. And uh, so they, they took the gun and patted me down, and they put the Surefire flashlight out of my back pocket. I haven't seen that yet. And took whatever else they wanted and uh, had me sit in the back of one of the cars. And... Uh, one of the deputies told me that there was a deceased woman inside and that was all he would say about it he obviously I mean I understand he can't ID her because they don't know her so I was like you know about 30 years old dark hair heavy set yep okay so uh, I I got back over to the police car and Oh, let me backtrack a little bit there as well. Um, before, as soon as I got to the house and I had the spotlight on the door, before I even called Brian or my dad, um, after talking to the dispatcher, she had asked, did you call any of her friends or families to see if she's with them, you know? So I got to thinking about it, and pretty much all of our friends are our friends. You know, we don't really have her friends, my friends kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We're couples, we're friends with couples, we're part of groups, it's kind of how we are, we're together, and uh, the only thing I'd think of was, you know, I'm sorry, evidently it's not on silent, yeah. oh, it's my dad, he must be here, <laughs> so, uh, where's that, oh, so I get on the phone and I call her mom, and I didn't want to scare her mom, get her worked up or anything, so I just asked her, you know, she does talk to you today. I've been trying to get a hold of her and I haven't gotten anything. No, no, she hasn't talked to me at all. Okay, well, that's kind of strange. Uh, all right, well, that's all I wanted to know. And all she said was, okay, well, let me know when you get a hold of her. And that was the end of the mother-in-law contact. So I don't know if the deputy in Grant County's got a hold of her yet but as of my last knowledge she was she still didn't know anything yeah, I, I don't know either okay and uh, so anyways back to where I was at uh, they put me in the, the cruiser and you know from then on it's just uh, officer popping in and talking a little bit and stepping back out and that was about all okay and when they described the female that they found inside did that they didn't mean, I, I mean told them to you well okay you described it to them you're right and they said so, yes okay that's probably her okay so i guess as of now i still can't say for sure but i'm pretty sure yeah i believe that it was your wife that was found inside the house okay you said that you had your dad's 45 with you. Yeah, my dad was a sergeant with the Franklin County Sheriff's Department for many years. And uh, he had a old 80 series Colt Mark IV 1911 that uh, was his duty pistol for many years. And he uh, shot competitively for the police department and got all kinds of great awards for it and everything. And uh, after the deployments and everything, it's like, yeah, heirloom. Oh, that's a nice yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> did you keep any other guns inside the house? Yeah, I had a few. Okay, what kind of guns did you have in there? Um, let's see, I had, uh, well, let's go with Dez's. Um, when her grandfather died, her mom... Uh, left a few guns to us because you know, military guy I shoot I got Des going on it so she left uh, a Remington Wingmaster 
to a shotgun. Yeah, and a Remington Huntsmaster, which is a pump action 30 out six. And then uh, two revolvers made by Haas. Um, they were Sig Sawyer before Sig Sawyer got together. <laughs> what, color, what caliber are the revolvers? One of them is a 22 long rifle, and one of them is a 357. They're both single actions. Um, Des also had a carry pistol that was a uh, Ruger LCP 380. And then uh, on the top shelf of the closet of the of one of the guest rooms, um, we're using it for a, a storage unit at the moment. It'd be the one. Um, as you're coming down the driveway to the right hand side mm -hmm. in that closet is where I kept them all and I have a gun safe yet and uh, so all the guns would should be together in that one spot right except for her carry pistol she would have and then uh, my carry pistol is the one that was stolen okay, the 1911 and, yeah the Springfield Arms one and uh, I haven't been carrying a while that's why I let my LCP or my uh, CPL expire. It's uh, you know one of those things I've been trying to train myself off of. <laughs> Life's not that dangerous. Yeah. You said you were in the military. Yeah, thirteen years. Thirteen years. Uh, and you were a mechanic. Mm-hmm. Did you get deployed in combat areas? Yeah, we had a couple deployments. Where at? Iraq. Right. Yeah, and um, I mean that just covers hers. Well, for, so you've got your own guns as well. Yeah, uh, my grandpa's. It's one of those things he likes to give guns for presents. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, up on the the top shelf up there, I also had a, uh, a Jennings nine mil that I got from a coworker that couldn't get it to fire uh, consistently. It was running in single action. So I replaced a few springs in it and played with it and first time I test fired it the frame cracked on it <laughs> so it got stripped apart and there's piles of the gun sitting on the top shelf and uh, then as, as far as the rest of them is concerned I've got my first gun ever was in there it's a uh, Ruger or I'm sorry Norinco JW15 it's a 22 long rifle bolt action And uh, and I also had well 22s. We'll we'll work our way up. I had a Ruger 10-22 that my dad got me. And of course, that's a 22 long rifle, the only caliber available for it. And uh, let's see, probably next smallest would be uh, well, I had the two 22s, an M1 Grand the 30-06 M1 Garand, G-A-R-A-N-D. Good man. <laughs> um, a Model 98 Mauser, 8 mil. Um, a Remington Model 10 12-gauge shotgun. another shotgun in 22 but that's at the mother-in-law's um, the Colt that your officer has in his trunk oh my baby um, 1898 Springfield Arms 3040 Craig it's actually a K You um, said that you tried to call Desiree on the way back from the Tri-Cities. When was the last time that you actually talked to her on the phone? The last time I talked to her was at the funeral service. 
on Saturday. Yeah. What time do you think that was? Um, all right, I'll see if it's still stored in here. You can just give me an approximate time for now. It'll be close enough. We can. I'm just check trying it. to give it to you as, as specific as I can. 9-11. Yesterday, 8.36. Let's see, I would be looking for Saturday. Here we go. Oh, evidently I talked to her. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was only a couple minutes. I guess the last communication I had with her was 6.29 p.m. for seven minutes. And the phone call at the funeral. Now that's only three minutes. That's Oh, she called me back because it got messed up. No. What's her phone number? Des's? Yeah. It's uh, 509, of course. 750 0863. Do you guys have a home phone, a landline? No. You just use the cell phones? Just the cells. And um, is her phone through ATT as well? Yeah, same account. So you talked to her yesterday evening for about seven <clears throat> minutes, and did she indicate that anything was wrong or everything seemed okay? That no, time? it was fine. I mean, obviously it's a short mess or short phone call. It was only seven minutes, but uh, yeah, it was just a quick uh, hi. Yeah, it looks like I'm gonna stay. It's okay. it's going kind of long. Love you. Talk to you soon. See you tomorrow. You know. Then you stayed at your dad's in Kennewick. Uh, no, I actually stayed with a friend, but, uh, I, let's see. What's the friend's name? Oh, her name's Paige. She's a mutual friend. Um, I guess it was probably about 10 that I got back together. At uh, at Mary's for the breakfast. 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. Yeah. And everybody else left out of there at about the same time. We all all left slightly after noon. Where's Paige live? She's up in Moses Moses Lake or Warden actually. Sorry. Same thing. <laughs> What's Paige's last name? Uh, Blades. Do you have a phone number for her? Uh, I'm sure I do. She's a 501 also. 501? Uh, 509, I mean, sorry. Uh, 431 2273. How far is Warden from the Tri Cities? It's, it's about an hour. About an hour? Yeah. Which way? It's damn near as long as coming here. Yeah. But I had to go up there because of uh, the guitars that I had in the trunk. She's uh, she's a mutual friend of ours for a while. Oh, it's my dad. Or no, that's shit. That's the mother-in-law. At 10.30, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, she's been... I got two of my friends now that I've gotten started in the music. One of my friends, I got started on bass, and she used to play acoustics, and uh, she was wanting to get back into it a little bit, and so 
after collecting the guitars up at my dad's house, had to go show her one I thought she'd like. So I got this little Kent. Um, it's, God, probably half as heavy as a normal guitar is. It's just a real slim body, narrow fretboard, quick action, just great beginner guitar. So what, when did you drive to Wharton? Um, God, probably about 11. 11 o'clock. Yeah, it was late. Night. And what time do you think you arrived at Paige's house? I'd say 1230-ish. She had already um, went and laid down, so I had to go wake her butt up. <laughs> And then you said you, you got back to the Tri-Cities about 10 a.m. on Sunday for breakfast with your family? Yeah, pretty close. I think it was about 8.45 I left there, so that would put me there about right. Because I, on the way to Warden, I did the, uh, what is that, the Central Washington University Research Area slash Warden Turnoff by the Scutney Reservoir out Booker Road. I'm not Anyways. familiar with that area. Yeah, well, I took that route to get to her house, and then on the way back I came down uh, 17, gassed up in Othello, and rolled out from there. Did uh, Desiree know that you were going to Pages? I don't know. Honestly, it's not something you had discussed with her. No. No, Paige would come stay with us. We'd stay with her. Was it uh, just a platonic friendship, or were you did you, did you well, have a sexual relationship with Paige? You know, I shouldn't go there because it's kind of rude. But uh, well, Des didn't want me to say anything to anybody. But she kind of had uh, mixed feelings, and if I'll do anything, but that's one thing I can't provide for. So at one point, her and Paige had a, a little thing going for a while there, a little experiment. Okay, so it was so, it was Desiree and Paige who had the sexual relationship. Yeah, and but not you and Paige. Or we all did. Sometimes you and Paige too. Honestly, we all did. Okay. So you don't think it, it would probably would not have bothered Desiree to know that you were going to stay with Paige? No. And honestly, we didn't even do anything. I was out on the couch anyways because it's kind of one of those things where as long as we're going to do anything, we need to make sure we all are fine with doing anything. So, so it's everybody all, stays informed. All right. So if there's no information or no previous arrangements made, nothing happens. Avoid hard feelings. So it sounds like you and Desiree had a pretty open relationship as long as the community Generally, no. Were, no. Generally, no. Just with her. Just with her. There was a special relationship with Paige. Yeah. Okay. How how uh, had you and Desiree been getting along lately? Great. No problems in the marriage? No. Typical marriage things, you know, bickering and picking at each other for stupid little things. Yeah, no big fights though. No. Don't worry. Kiss and hug and go to night happy, or go to bed at night happy, you know. That's right. You, let's go back to the military experience. You spent 13 years in the military. Yeah. What branch? Army National Guard. Okay. And you were a mechanic, you said. Mm -hmm. and you did two tours in combat areas? Yeah. Okay. What, what areas of the world were you in? Um, Iraq, Germany. Uh, Kuwait. That's about it. Was all the combat in Iraq? Yeah. Okay. 
Did you see any direct combat? Yeah. Yeah. Did you suffer injuries in combat? Um, I got blown up a few times, but nothing really. Well, I got shot too, but I was wearing body armor. So it didn't cause any injuries. Shot and blown up. So you were really in the combat. You were close to the front line. Well, I mean, when you stop and think about it in the grand scheme of things, not really. No? How did you get blown up? Was it like some kind of IED or...? Well, okay, one of them was a VB IED. I work in a checkpoint, car bomb blows up, people go flying. Um, another one was an RPG that hit near me and kind of tipped me over, rung the bell a little. And then the three other ones were in vehicles while I was operating them, you know, roadside IEDs. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, so. That's rough. How, yeah. how, how, how are you coping with that? Well, according to the military, I'm what they call mentally resilient. Mentally resilient, so you're, yeah. you're dealing with it. You've talked to the right people at the military, and they feel like you're moving forward with your life. And, yeah. Yeah. They said I deal with things quite well. I'm very resilient mentally, so. Well, that's good. Personally, I've just found that it's, it works really good for me to stand back, to step back away from the problem and look at things from an outside perspective and kind of displace yourself. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier to handle things. You get a little too close and too involved into it, and it starts starts to bug you. So, and I kept trying to just kind of stand off and shut up and regain myself and hold it together. It's still not real to me yet. How long have you been out of the military? Oh, I've only been out for uh, I would say end of November, first of December, oh, so right in there. That was recent. Yeah. Yep, I uh, I broke my left femur pretty bad, and I got some titanium in there, and I broke my back and broke my neck and broke. Or I got uh, three bad joints in this shoulder and four in this one, so I can't really do any heavy lifting or you know working over my head too much. So they put me down as uh, non-retainable and just let my enlistment run out. So I didn't get to get the boot or anything. All of that was a result of your injuries and the explosions, all those broken bones and well, plates. And stuff. this one, um, that one was from Fort Knox. Uh, the rest of it was overseas, but of course, without an actual, I get shot. There's a hole. There it is. It happens. The rest of it, you know, I, well, like when I broke my neck. Um, I didn't even know I broke my neck. All I knew is I hit the top of the truck really hard. It hurt. I saw pretty lights and stars. Mm -hmm. And then I couldn't turn my head more than about that far each direction for a couple of months. And then uh, I got a haircut and one of the Iraqi barbers are doing the shoulder rub thing and popped my neck. And next thing I know, my head works fine again. So, mm. great. <laughs> wow. And then after the fact, after I come back and they're doing x-rays, they're like, oh, look, you broke your neck about a year ago. Oh, middle of my deployment. Yeah, I know that one. <laughs> so what have you been doing since you got back? Or since you got released from the military in November? Well, since that, nothing. Nothing. No. Nope. Unemployed? Yeah. Okay. Doesn't matter, actually just looking at starting up a, a business. What kind of business? Well, I figured since I'm a mechanic and my entire military enlistment was as a recovery guy driving M88 Wreckers that I'd be a tow truck driver. Makes sense. And uh, like I told her, well, I don't want to get fired again. <laughs> yeah. So as long as I run the show, I can't get fired again. So uh, yeah, we're actually just looking into the business license and the incorporation and all that to try to figure something out. I was just talking to my dad. He's got a friend of his down in the Tri-Cities that used to be a tools distributor with him that uh, started a towing company, I guess, about eight years ago. And so I figured, well, I've been running it for eight years. He's obviously doing something right. Maybe he's got a spare truck or two I can lease or buy off of him. Yeah. 
get kicked into high gear off of that. So was Desiree working? Yeah, she was an uh, art teacher at the Wapato Middle School. Oh, okay. How long has she been working there? This is her second year. How long have you two been married? Ten in November. Ten? Well, wow. Yeah. Met in middle school, started dating in high school. And then uh, the first deployment came up and I got activated and mobilized and sent over to Fort Lewis and they let us go for uh, Thanksgiving, a little break there for a week. And when I came back on that little break, we, uh, we decided it'd be a damn good time to go ahead and do it. You know, we'd already been talking about it for over a year. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of waiting for the, the time and the money and everything to go and put together a nice shindig. And, and it was like, you know what, it, it just doesn't make sense. I just want to get married now so that if something happens to me when I'm over there, you're guaranteed to be good. Or, you know, if, if I'm gone and you need to do something, you can. Like, for instance, she had to buy a new car while I was gone. Well, with us being married and her having a power of attorney, it made things a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So okay. it was just kind of the, the thing that finally forced us to do it, made us hurry up and get it done instead of beating around the bush. But, yep, it was fun. Yeah. It just sucked having to take off right away afterwards. Mm -hmm. But when I came back, combat pay built up in the bank. We took off. We went down to Oregon for... <laughs> Like a week and a half, and horse rides down the beach, and ate at every place we could. And I showed her all my favorite places down there. Went and fed the sea lions together, and went through the little aquarium, and petting the little sea anemones. And yeah, a good time. Yeah, sounds like it. Sounds like a great start to the marriage. You guys have Facebook accounts? Yeah. Is it under your names? Um, I think there. hers is under um, her email, the Chevy Des one. She uses it a lot more than I do. The only thing I really do on there is just kind of log in and check on stuff that other people are posting. I'm not one of those guys that throws a bunch of pictures and comments up. Yeah, every time you yeah. eat something, you have right. a picture of it. Yeah. <laughs> like, for instance, I, I got an alert earlier today when... My dad tagged me in a timeline something or another, you know, mm -hmm. for a lunch at Carl's. Really? <laughs> I used to get on her all the time because she'd go on there and she'd post something like, uh, you know, getting ready to take off to Moses Lake to go visit my mom for the week. And I'm like, oh, no! Come and burglarize yeah, the Yeah, don't tell everybody we're gone. Quit it! Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't make much sense. So I got her broke of that habit about a year ago. She's been pretty good. You said you have ADT on the house now? Yeah. And they monitor? Yeah. So but they know when the doors open and close and everything? Right. Okay. And, and you can disarm it and arm it from your phone? Yeah. Okay. And you, you stopped on Fauché Road just south of 24 to check the alarm status and you re rebooted your phone. Mm -hmm. um, how long did that take, that process of rebooting and then resetting the alarm? Uh, well, the alarm was still on. It just, the app, it said it was offline or could not connect or something. I assume that was com from coming through uh, uh, Conowac, yeah. yeah. From coming through the past, temporary loss of signal, whatever. So I just rebooted it, and almost immediately it started working again. And what was the status of the alarm? What did you call it? Um, for being, you're at home, and yeah. the motion sensors. On yeah, the there's arm. there's three statuses. There's disarmed, then there's home away, and that has the motion sensor on, and the door sensors on, and then there's home stay, and that means you're in the house with the alarm armed and you're going to be walking around so no motion sensors okay and so it was on home stay when you first observed it yes and then but you changed it to home away thinking that she would hear it chirping or set right. it off or something or she like would that. walk through the room and trip it 
Okay. And hopefully that would get her attention and she'd get pissed at me and get on the phone and quit screwing with me. Because as long as it's been on this uh, little trial period, because once they install it, they give you that one week to get used to it. As long as it's been on that, uh, the installer is telling us, you know, sometimes couples, the first one up in the morning will set it off because the last one that went to bed armed it for them real quick. Yeah. Or the first person to leave will arm it so that when the next person gets up, it'll go off. And yeah. It's like, you know, couples like to play with each other with that. So I was kind of doing that a little bit. Yeah. I'd log on there remotely and turn it on for her. I never did get her, though. I left the house and I passed her on the road uh, one day and I logged on real quick and armed it knowing that oh, she's going to be home in like two minutes. This is going to be funny. She's going to call me. No, she gets home and disarms it before she even went in. Ruined it. When you got out there, but it sounds like by the time you actually made it to the house, you were pretty frantic. Like you felt like something had gone wrong. My stomach was churning. I was shaking. I, I had convinced myself by that point something had to be wrong. Okay, and so why not go in the house and check things out and make sure she's okay? Because I was afraid. What were you afraid of? When I saw that back door, I, I just couldn't decide whether, whether I, I could deal with what I may or may not see. What was it about the back door that you saw that really made you feel like there was a burglary at the house? Um, when I put up the, the board on it last weekend, it covered all the glass. The bottom, maybe quarter inch or a quarter of the plank, probably about that far up, was snapped off so I could see the glass exposed. So I, I knew something had been done. I haven't been out there, so just by okay. what you're describing to me, this is what I'm picturing. Um, there you go. You had a, your back door had like a, a window in it, and you had put a board over it because of a previous burglary that had happened. Um, the week prior, Saturday, between 2 and 4 is what we're suspecting. Yeah, on, on April 2nd. There was a burglary out there. Exactly. I think April 2nd would have been the Tuesday when I reported it. But, okay, that's when it was reported. It was right. Like April 2nd. Yeah, what we were thinking was that the burglary happened Saturday between 2 and 4 p.m. Okay. And reason being, um, I went up the street and talked to the neighbors. And the gal, uh, if I'm going up my driveway, the one on the right has an American flag and a Marine Corps flag up. I stopped in there and she'd said that uh, Saturday afternoon between 2 and 4 she saw a truck drive down the driveway and back out of the driveway and then a little while later drive back down there and back out again. And uh, after walking around with Deputy Woodchuck and looking at it, it, he said that it appeared to him that whoever was in there got spooked or you know for some reason they quit early. Mm -hmm because all they managed to grab was a couple of computers and some broken iPhones and her iPad and you know my gun and just a couple of things so it's not like they really cleaned this out and um, so he said they may be back that obviously put up red flags that's why the next day I had ADT out there or actually same day I had ADT out there and uh, so after I um, I looked around there a little bit. It was driving me nuts, and I, I mean, I knew I had to do something with the door, but Desert already called the homeowner's insurance, and they had a case open. They were already working on something. And uh, I went down to Lowe's, got an estimate, everything. And it's just time being, you know, to get it by. I ran a, a bead of caulk around the edge of the uh, window pa uh, frame, mm -hmm. and then put up the board over it to seal it in so we couldn't get bugs and drafts and stuff for the time being. Okay. And it was just one solid like half inch piece of plywood or is that 
Yeah, it was probably half inch. It was that chipboard. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Just like a particle board type. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when you arrived there tonight, the bottom part of that board was broken away? Right. Okay. And from where I was standing, because, I mean, the porch is out here, uh, my car would have been over here with the light pointed at it. Um, and the porch is, you know, a little bit of a cement pad, and then the steps. From where I was at, I couldn't see the plank. So I don't know if they broke it off and beat the glass out with it or threw it off to the side or what. But, yeah, door was shut, which I thought was pretty weird. And... I just didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't know if she got home and saw it and then freaked out and left or anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you were too afraid of what you might find to, to go in and check and see if she was all right? Yeah. I can deal with a lot of things, but I think that's outside of my realms. So your your thought was that she was there and there was something wrong with her and you couldn't deal with it? Yeah. Is that accurate? Because otherwise... She, just... she would have called me. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just thinking... You're a, you're a big guy. You're what, six four, somewhere so, up there. Six four, two fifty. You you've got a firearm on you. You've been in combat. I mean, you've done some serious shit that most people will never do. Um, so if anyone's going to be willing to go charging in the house and make sure their wife's okay, it would seem to me that it would be you. Well. It's not that I was afraid of anybody being in there. You know, I, I'll take on a hundred people for her, that's fine. Yeah. That wasn't the concern, it was her. You just don't want to see what may have happened to her. Yeah. And what did you think you might see if you went inside? Roll around a thousand of the worst things you could think of. The only reason I would have been forced to go in there, the only reason I could talk myself into it, was the fear that she still needed me in there. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. if she's, if she was in there and she was hurt and uh, scared or restrained, and I was sitting outside, just idly waiting, while well, she's in there going through that alone, that would have killed me. So if, if somebody else goes in there and it's fine, everything's empty, that's great. The other thing I can't deal with. You mentioned that you got a bunch of alarm hits on your through your phone at like three in the morning or three I didn't write the times down. Yeah, I'll bring them up for you. The alarm is monitored. Kind of. And, and you could see where she, you, you thought she went in and out and then back in. Yeah, kind of. I mean, it doesn't stay connected. It automatically times out after three hours of inactivity. So if I'm not screwing around with it every three hours, it shuts off. And it's set up to her email and her phone number. So if it goes off, she gets an email and a text message saying it went off. Mm -hmm. I don't. Evidently, the front door is open right now. Once it finishes doing its thing here, I can show you what I'm talking about. See how it still says connecting for a remote. Mm -hmm. Did you guys install any surveillance cameras or anything with the security system? No, I asked her about it and I asked the ADT guy about it because I wanted to get one on the garage pointed up the driveway. Mm -hmm. So if anybody came in, I could at least get the vehicle license plate, maybe a shot of them. But that was what I was worried about. And uh, the ADT guy said to, that he used Tiger Direct, just you know, go online, order some up, and add them. 
because the ADT ones are stupid overpriced and evidently they're not that great. So we were we we're window shopping for some. It was in the works. It was going to happen. Now well, while we're sitting here waiting, front door. Okay, 9:24 p.m. was when it was open tonight, and it's been open since apparently. Closed. Yeah, see, 3:27 a.m. Now it's just updated. Evidently, they've opened and closed it again. But yeah, 3:27 a.m. yesterday, it was closed twice. So that tells me that it was a vibration sensor, not the actual opening. 326, 324. So it looks like a flurry of activity around 0, 324. Yeah, 323. And then 6.17 p.m. And 7.43. Oh, sorry, I'm upside down. <laughs> 917, 923. So that's probably, you know, letting the dog out and back in. What kind of dog is it that you guys have? She's a shepherd mix. She's a chipped dog. She came from the pound, so they put one of those tracking chips in her. Her name's Ada. Uh, she, I, she just went into the vet. I think they said she was 42 pounds when they weighed her. And we adopted her from the Grant County Humane Society, so they would have her file. Okay. And, uh, okay. Is, is Ada pretty protective? No, she's only barked at a couple of people. She's just a cuddly lap dog. And back door. 11.27. That would have been you guys. So, 3.28 a.m. yesterday multiple triggers 327 it was opened 328 it was closed so we're looking at right around 330 in the morning okay and living room motion I don't see anything on it only trouble and alarm events are available for this sensor so nothing so I understand the uh, sequence of events. Y you were you left Yakima about zero eight thirty on Saturday and drove down to the Tri Cities. Yep. And you were there all day at the funeral with your family. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, uh, around 11 o'clock Saturday night you drove to Warden mm -hmm. and then you left Warden at about 8.30 in the morning on Sunday is that right? yeah, 8.30, 8.45 Go back to the Tri Cities, where you had breakfast mm -hmm. with your family and hung out with them all day. Yep. And then you headed back from the Tri Cities to Yakima this evening. Uh, but, uh, Around eight o'clock, eight eight thirty. About eight o'clock is what, roughly what whatever driving time to where you were back in the Yakima area making phone calls um, around nine o'clock, roughly when you started calling the sheriff's office. And you called your friend Brian to see if he could come over. Um, you tried calling Desiree at 
PM. Okay. Is that pretty accurate account of your movements? I mean, not to the yeah. minute, of course, yeah. but um, pretty damn so, good timeline. So, did you drive back to Yakima for anything in between that time period? No. Okay, so you were Yakima, Tri Cities, Tri Cities, Warden, Warden, Tri Cities, back to Yakima. No trips to Yakima in the meantime. No. Okay. And so we can check cell phone records to confirm that and, mm -hmm. and show where the tower hits, and it should give a pretty clear picture of where you were and when yeah. every time your phone registered. Absolutely. I can't think of any time I shut it off other than that one reboot right by Fauche. I don't think I even rebooted any during the weekend. So the the phone was on most of the time? Yeah, all the time. Um, you said that Desiree's Facebook is under Chevy Des. Yeah, her email. Who's her email through? Yahoo. So it's Chevy Des at yahoo.com? Yeah. I don't know if you meant to write it that way or not, but that looks like an R. C H R V Y. At least it does to me. Uh, yeah, that's my penmanship. Okay. As long as you know it's an E. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But my E's get a little screwy sometimes, I guess. No, oh, I understand. <laughs> my hands are pretty beat up. I can't write unless I'm looking at it. What's your Facebook under? Uh, mine's under my Yahoo as well. What's your Yahoo? S. Sunford. No cap space is nothing weird. Where would uh, Desiree, you said that the 380, that Ruger LCP is her carry gun? Yes. Where would she keep it when she was at home? Nine times out of ten, it's either on her uh, the headboard, like above her pillow next to the alarm clock, or in the little cubby right above that. There's a couple of little double doors that open up. Or even above that on the very tip top of the headboard next to the lamp. But it's, it's always right there. Being that she's a teacher, she can't exactly keep it in her purse and take it to school, so... And you said that your relationship with her is solid. You guys haven't had any problems lately? No. One of the officers uh, mentioned to me that they were already getting on and looking at Facebook statuses, and there was a status update that said something similar. I haven't seen it, but it was like, uh, getting a divorce is harder than getting away with murder or something along that line. From who? It was on one of YouTube's Facebook pages. Hmm. I don't know. Is there, is there any reason that she would mention divorce? No, not unless it was jokingly, because uh, we were fine. You guys were good? Yeah. There was no arguing? No. Nothing serious. Not Just stupid little stuff, stuff, you know. Were you guys fighting about stupid little stuff during the time frame that you were gone? No, I was gone. We well, couldn't have been fighting. In between the Couples can fight over the telephone, though. No. Or before you leave. I and mean, I mean, it's totally understandable if, days. You're, if you did. I mean, because married married couples fight. 
No, and so it's no. better uh, to just tell me now. Because no, Friday, Friday we had a little bit of a fight for like probably 15 minutes, maybe half an hour. And then a couple hours later, we sat down and we cuddled on the love seat and talked for a while. And What was that fight about? Um, pretty much because of my memory. <laughs> Why? What did you forget? My short-term memory is horrible. You can tell me something one minute, a couple minutes later, it's gone. And, uh, you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll mess up and think I told her something because I was thinking to tell her something. You know what I mean? <laughs> it makes it in your head but not out your mouth. What uh, what were you supposed to tell her that you didn't? I don't even remember. Her mom was right there. Her mom was there? Yeah, I just barked at her a little bit. But then you guys made up right away? Oh, yeah. Okay. No other recent fights? No. Did uh, Desiree have problems with anyone else? Was there anyone else that she has fought with recently or that you can think of that might want to hurt her? Nothing. I mean, who hates an art teacher? Yeah, I don't know. If it's an elective, everybody that's in there wants to be there. So she hasn't had problems with anyone? No. Neither one of us. Other than her um, relationship with Paige, was did she have any other sexual relationships that you know of? No, a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, before we were even married, she cheated on me at one point with another guy, but, uh, you know, that's long since over with. When you were dating, she yeah. had an affair? She, has she had any affairs since you've been married? No, not that I know of. She hasn't been good. <laughs> Okay. In the week since the burglary, have you seen anyone suspicious around the area or around the house? No, all I got from that was uh, the gal at the end of my driveway to the right with that American flag and the Marine Corps flag told me that uh, that Saturday between 2 and 4 there was a gray pickup and that's it. Okay. Um, since then, we had the ADT guy come out, and we had the mother-in-law come out, and I don't think I've even had any of my friends come out there. We haven't been there long, so it's not like there's that many people that know where we live. Okay. Was there any uh, life insurance on Desiree? I don't think so. I had a lot of life insurance on me and some on her, but when I lost my job, it went away. Who was it through for? Um, SGLI and SSLI. I set it all up so that if anything happened to me on any of the deployments, it should be good. SGLI and what was the second one? SSLI. It's service member group life insurance and state sponsored life insurance. They're both military only, so they've obviously went away as soon as the whole enlistment status changed. Okay. So as far as you know, there isn't aren't any policies in effect right now? No, I don't think so. Because when she signed her teaching contract, I had such good coverage on us that I don't think she would have opted for any. Is there anything else that you can think of that I should know about? I can't think of anything. Um, we already gave the, the deputies the uh, serial number for the iPad so they could try to track that. Um, she did tell me that she had it locked so they couldn't boot it up, log in, get on a Wi-Fi network, and get hit that way. 
Uh, did she have another computer at home still that she could be on? Yeah, I, I gave her uh, one of my old laptops for her classroom, and she brought that in from the classroom. Okay. And that was sitting on the desk in front of the computer's monitor from where the desktop was. And that one was a little, uh, it was a Dell Inspiron 1505. That was her uh, a little work computer. And she brought that in so that we could do the emails and everything to deal with the robbery. You mentioned that you shut your phone off to reboot it. Um, is it very common for you to have to turn your phone off? Every few days or so it starts kind of jamming up. It does this thing where you hit the home button and it'll work and then other times you hit the home button and it won't work and you gotta sit there and pound it for 10 minutes and it just jams up. And I just do a quick restart and it generally starts behaving better. I missed a phone call here just a second ago, so I need to double check uh, what that what uh, they were calling about. So well, I could I use a. A little break to the facility myself. My okay. bladder's getting this, pretty... this would be a good time to take a break then. Okay. Uh, the time right now is zero one twenty one hours, and I'm Detective Sam Pro. Okay. It shouldn't take too much longer here. We should be able to wrap this up. Okay. Uh, we're back on the recorder the time right now is 0146 hours <clears throat> detective Sam Paul one thing that I wanted to ask you about that yep. I picked up on during our break during the burglary yes you mentioned that um, you had a friend who stayed with you guys who had a possessive boyfriend yep um and you thought that he may have been responsible for the damage yep who who is the friend with the possessive boyfriend um the friend is Paige. that's how she started staying with us okay that's how her and uh her and des started building their relationship the, the possessive boyfriend his name is um Dylan Williams. At the time I left it at that because there was, you know, you hate to point fingers without a um, any justification, you know what I mean? I, uh, I don't want to make ac wild accusations. I was just trying to get the guy informed and uh, give him a direction. Okay. And so Dylan is Paige's boyfriend. Ex. Ex-boyfriend, they're not yeah. together? Okay. Did he come up at all in your visit with Paige when you drove up there? Not since we've been at that home. Okay. But did you guys... Did you talk to Paige about him at all when you were there Saturday night? No. Okay. No. So she didn't mention him? No. I, uh, go back to this little guy for a second. After, after the robbery, I contacted her to ask her if she thought that he was, um, would have been a, a good suspect whatever you want to call it you know if he was a concern and um, she sent me pictures of his truck and his truck is a blue truck and that's his license plate number
and then she sent me a text message that I made a note of. Uh, da, da. Have you had any run-ins with Dylan? Um, not for quite some time. Do you know where Dylan lives? Oh, I now remember where I put that note. I have actually been gathering information on him since the robbery. And as soon as I find it, here we go. He is staying with a man named Matt. His address is 651 South Grand Drive in Moses Lake. And then the reason that I um, made good note of it is Matt, the roommate, his girlfriend, has a white Dodge truck, license number, Bravo 3826, 626. 3826. Bravo 3826, no 8. That one needs to go away. There six you go. five, Charles. Mm -hmm. And he also rides a Sportster twelve hundred. License nine seven eight three seven four. And there's his mobile number seven seven zero zero one four zero. That's Dylan's number? Yeah. Dylan Williams right there. And uh, I had her go over there and visit him uh, the other night to see if she could um, basically inconspicuously get me his whereabouts and look for any of my property that might be in his place because that like i told the officer at the time with a robbery like that when they take only the tower and not the rest of the accessories it implies that they're after the data mm -hmm. that they're not after the monetary value and i mean it maybe i'm just being uh abnormally paranoid here in my train of thoughts off but you take the computer tower, you want the data. You take the laptop, you want digital data. You take an iPad, you're looking for communications. You take a couple of old iPhones, you're looking for communications. You see what, Sometimes, what had uh, me if, going? If uh, a lot of the times in our standard burglaries, tweakers grab electronics just because right. they can pawn them for... Uh, five bucks or whatever. I understand that and that's what the, the deputy had told me as well but it was still it was in there you know what I mean mm -hmm. it's uh, I mean my laptop didn't have anything important on it that anybody else would have wanted but it had the copy of my DD-201 army personnel file on there and you know it had old pictures from deployment on there um, it had uh, you know some technical data from the M1 tanks and the Bradleys and the stuff that I was doing at work. So it's not like it was anything that the general public would be interested in. But if somebody got it, they would have my personnel file with my social security number all over it. Mm -hmm. So that gave me concern. So, I mean, maybe I'm way off the hook on this. Maybe it was just tweakers looking for stuff, but it seemed personal to me. It just felt that way. 
And uh, so that, that's why I, I brought it up and I looked into it and tried to see what I could find. I also went around to the, a couple of the pawn shops in town and asked them. And ironically enough, the one that was the most helpful to me was the one that I was told has a bad habit of acquiring stolen property. That's that one on the f corner of First and Knob. And uh, Des pointed me to that one. She said she talked to the mail person and that they recommended going there. And after talking to a few other place, uh, people, they basically confirmed that, yeah, they're kind of a shady place. And uh, the rest of the pawn shops, they just told me, hey, we can't tell you what we got in. We can't tell you who brought what. We, we can't tell you a damn thing. Mm -hmm. All you can do is come in, give us the case number with list of serial numbers, and wave and leave. And if we feel like checking it and notifying the police department, we will. Otherwise, screw you. Go away. Yeah. So that's what I got from all of them. And um, I believe the guy's name was Beto, who's the manager of that one on First and Knob. And the gal actually brought him out, so I got to speak with the manager owner, whatever you want to call him. And I talked to him for a while, and he told me, you know, I haven't seen anything like that come in. Uh, thanks for the heads up. So I thought it was kind of odd that, of all the places, that someone that's supposed to be non-cooperative and shady is the one that was being helpful. Yeah, I've actually had mixed results with them myself. Part of the investigation as we process the crime scene is going to be, um, of course, looking for DNA evidence. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, um, we're going to need to um, take Desiree's DNA and your DNA and um, compare it to what we find. Of course, we, right. we expect to find your DNA at your right, house, right, right. Um, but we still need to have a, a sample of it as a So you can eliminate any yeah. DNA. Right. Yeah. So um, I would ask that you submit to um, a couple oral DNA swaps. Not a problem. Okay. I think I'm already in the federal database on that anyways. I would recommend, however, that you also collect her mother's DNA. Her mother was up there with us this last week. Okay. How old are you? 31. Okay, this is just our standard voluntary permission to search form. It says I, Scott Sunford, 320 North St. Hilaire Road, Yakima, Washington, uh, 31 years of age, being in legal custody or control uh, of the premises. Two oral DNA swabs. I've been informed that a detective, Sam Peralt, of the Yakima County Sheriff's Office, would like to search the above indicated person. I understand that I'm a refuse to consent to this search. I understand that if I consent to the search, I withdraw or revoke that consent. I understand that I may limit the scope of the consent to certain areas. I understand the evidence found during the search may be used in court against me or any person. 
I hereby grant permission to search the above listed person. This permission is granted without threats or promises of any kind by any police agency. The granting of this permission is free and voluntary act. And I'll have to ask you to sign right there. Yeah. After the interview with Scott concluded and police had learned about the three-way relationship he and Desiree had with Paige Blades, police brought her in for an interview. Little did detectives know, months later, that it would be an anonymous tip that would lead them to the killer. In part two, Code 3 will present to you the interview with Paige Blades. Please like and subscribe so you can be updated as soon as part two of this story is released.